name is Kelly Asbury and I'm a director here at Sony Pictures Animation. I was born in Beaumont, Texas. Beaumont, Texas was very much uh, generally a working class sort of blue collar town. No one had more than anyone else. When I was a teenager, if I wanted a car or if any of my friends wanted a car, we got jobs, we saved up for it. It wasn't handed to us. My dad was a Navy veteran from World War II. My dad was an interesting character. He was an amateur magician, he could juggle, he could walk on stilts, he could ride a unicycle. He was all these very odd things. One of the games my dad and I would do is we would make up stories and we would sort of compete and draw pictures to tell that story. And I'll always think that was a big part of why animation became so much a part of my life is it really is drawing pictures and making up stories for a living. So I will always think that that was the root of, of where I kind of started my animation love. My dad passed away when I was 12 years old uh, from cancer. I think what that did, you know, was really instill in me early on that I was gonna have to grow up. My mom instilled that work ethic and she did always say that anything you want, you have to work for. Anything you want is not worth having unless you work for it. And that's certainly proven to be true in every aspect of my life. When I was seven years old at the Jefferson Theater in Beaumont, Texas at a matinee, my brother took me to see Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs. I remember I said to my brother, I really want to learn how to make my drawings move like that. You know, you hear people say that they had a calling. I do believe that I had a calling to work in animation um, from that day forward. A book came out written by Christopher French called The Art of Walt Disney. I saved up my money and I bought this book. And that was the first time that I saw behind the scenes. And I realized all these different types of artists were working on these movies. And so I knew, okay, this dream I've got is gettable. I can do this because certainly among all these different people doing all these different things to make a movie, I can fit in there somewhere. And there was a hero of mine that was mentioned in that book named Ken Anderson who had long been an art director for Disney. I wrote a letter of probably the biggest fan letter in the world, it was probably 10 pages long, just you know, expounding about my love for Disney and how I want to work there. I sent a few examples of drawings, and uh, he forwarded my letter to the production manager at the time. The guy's name was Don Duckwall. I never met Don Duckwall, but when I got the letter back, I thought it was some sort of gag. I thought, there's a guy named Donald Duckwall that works at Disney? It turns out he was an actual real person. He, uh, he wrote me back a very nice letter and he told me, here's how someone your age can nurture their talents to get into our studio and become a member of our staff. And he told me about a place called California Institute of the Arts. I spent the next three years focusing on getting in CalArts. Uh, it took me three tries. I went to a local university in Beaumont, Texas called Lamar University. I really went there to develop a portfolio to continually submit to CalArts. And I was fortunate enough to meet an art professor there named Jerry Newman, Dr. Jerry Newman, who was a very well-respected artist regionally in Texas and Louisiana. A very intimidating guy, but I came to him and I showed him my work and I told him my goal of working in the animation business. And I gave him the whole story and he said, okay, look, I can help you with this. He, he really, really researched what sort of artwork they were looking for. And one day he gave me five 100-page sketchbooks that were empty. And he said, take these sketchbooks and take this crop of pens and go to the zoo and go to football games and go to ballets and watch your dog at home, whatever you have to do, but fill up one drawing on every page of these, that's 500 drawings, on every page of these sketchbooks. Simple, linear, gestural drawings. At the end of the semester, I came back to him and he laid out all the drawings on this floor of this art room, all 500 of them. And he started going through and just picking and culling through these drawings. And when we were all done, I had 25 sketches left. And he said, that's your portfolio for CalArts. Assembled it, sent it to CalArts, and I got a full scholarship. The most exciting, happiest moment in my life, when I really think about it above everything else, was when that acceptance letter dropped through the mail slot. That was when I knew I was on the road 
to doing this thing that was really all I had prepared myself for. I don't know what I would have done had I not gone to CalArts, had I not worked at Disney and gotten in the animation business. CalArts felt like this mecca that everyone that had similar interests had gone to. And prior to that, I was in Beaumont, Texas, and I was the only one I could find that knew anything about animation. And then suddenly I meet all these people who are just like me. You suddenly realize, A, you're not alone in this world, and B, you're not so special. You know, CalArts was uh, this crazy uh, shared experience with people who, who really knew exactly what I wanted and I knew exactly what they wanted. And then when I was a freshman at CalArts, a group of friends and I were fortunate enough to be at an Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences tribute to Mel Blanc, who's the very famous voice actor from all sorts of cartoons at Warner Brothers. Sitting in front of us was Chuck Jones, legendary animated cartoon maker. And one of my friends, Jeff DeGrandis, that night wore a pair of rabbit ears on his head. He was kind of a character. And Chuck noticed him and they struck up a conversation. They exchanged contact information. And then a couple of days later, Chuck invited him and some of his friends to come out to his place in Corona Del Mar, California, and just sit around and talk about animation. Jeff invited me and a couple of other people, Rob Minkoff and Chris Bailey, and we all went as students, and we became very close friends with Chuck Jones. And for the next 25 years, while each of us were going through different phases of our career, he was always sort of this touchstone. We all went on and did exactly what we wanted to do, and it was largely because of the mentorship of Chuck Jones. And in the end, I think it was really lessons in planning, lessons in research, lessons in reading and literature and opening ourselves up to more than just making cartoons. He taught me to approach my job with depth, no matter how funny it's supposed to be. Uh, and that, that's valuable, valuable stuff. My first job in the animation business was at a small studio in Burbank called Tom Carter Productions. And then while I was working there, a friend of mine who had gotten a job at Disney just one day called me and said, look, they want to talk to you because they need someone to storyboard something in the live action division and uh, they want to see your portfolio, so here's a number. So I called the number and got, a, got the job very quickly and found myself at Disney um, after my second year at CalArts. After that movie was finished, I moved to the animation department. And I was asked to do in-between drawings for animation. Uh, and I did that for some time on a movie called The Black Cauldron. What's interesting about that is Life Magazine did a story about Disney. They advertised, basically, and had a story about the future of movies that are coming out. And one of them was the animated feature, The Black Cauldron. And I remember sitting in class in high school, and there was a friend of mine next to me, and I said, I'm gonna work on that movie. And she said, okay, great, you know. And then I did, and I my first screen credit is on The Black Cauldron. I worked on several little projects, and then I was fortunate enough to be asked to do development work on The Little Mermaid. It was this huge hit, and it sort of reintroduced everyone to Disney fairy tales. So to have been part of the early development of that movie was amazing, still is amazing to me. Uh, and then I went on to work on Beauty and the Beast. In 1991, my good friend, the, the late, great Joe Ranft, who is a great story artist, at the time he was heading story on a movie called The Nightmare Before Christmas, which had been developed at Disney by Tim Burton. I was a huge fan of Tim Burton's work, and I knew about this project, and I saw an opportunity I sent some artwork up to the director, Henry Selick. He accepted the work and I was actually allowed to leave Disney, uh, still working for Disney, but I moved to San Francisco and uh, worked on The Nightmare Before Christmas as a designer and an art director. It was truly a completely different world. Learned a whole new aspect of, of animation, but a magical experience. And Henry Selick, I think he's the greatest stop motion animator who's ever lived. After Nightmare Before Christmas, Joe Ranft had moved over to Pixar, this little studio that was across the bay that did computer animation. Joe called me up and said, look, we'd love you to come over and sort of help us storyboard on this movie called Toy Story that we're developing for Disney. 
the rest is history with that one. I mean, I was so lucky to have had that brief stint working on that movie. So I went on to work on James and the Giant Peach with Joe, another wonderful experience working with Henry. And around the time that James and the Giant Peach completed, word sprang out that Jeffrey Katzenberg had departed Disney after finishing The Lion King and that he and Steven Spielberg and David Geffen were starting a new company called DreamWorks. The whole world just changed overnight. I chose to go to DreamWorks and I was head of story along with Lorna Cook for the first film they made called Prince of Egypt. Uh, and I'll always see Prince of Egypt as this sort of great, grand experiment. There's a lot about that film that is quite beautifully done. When I started at DreamWorks, I let it be known to Jeffrey that I wanted to really be considered for directing possibilities. The first thing he sort of put me in charge of as a director was the early development of a movie called Shrek. Funny story based on a small children's book by William Steig. At the time, Chris Farley from Saturday Night Live and had been slated as the voice to play Shrek and the movie was tailored for him. Well, unfortunately, about a year and a half into our development, Chris Farley passed away, tragically. And that sort of put the movie in a bit of limbo. Jeffrey said, look, we're, we don't know what's gonna happen with Shrek. Why don't you move over here and I have a movie called Spirit, Stallion of the Cimarron, that I'd like you to co-direct with Lorna Cook. But after I finished Spirit, Jeffrey invited me to join the Shrek team and direct Shrek 2. Everything about the Shrek movies is about fun and about hilarity. And to work on that film and then to have it enjoy the huge success it had was a once in a lifetime experience. After I finished uh, Shrek 2, my friend Baker Bloodworth, who had been a production manager on Beauty and the Beast all those years earlier, he heard about my availability and he called me and said, I wanna talk to you about this movie that is involving Elton John music, garden gnomes, and Shakespeare. And I, I heard the story called Gnomeo and Juliet, and uh, I couldn't resist it. I just thought, there's a challenge. Let's see what we can make out of this. Very proud of the movie, worked with incredible people. It's, it's probably the high point of my career in terms of making a film. When I finished Gnomeo and Juliet, I had a little bit of time. Again, you know, this between picture thing is always a nice breathing time. So I helped out my friend Chris Buck on Frozen as a storyboard artist. I just came in and three or four days a week and storyboarded. Same thing with Wreck-It Ralph. My friend Rich Moore asked me to just, just, you know, kind of pitch in. In the meantime, I was looking at all sorts of projects and then Bob Osher and uh, Michelle Ramo Cuyate called me and they said they have a project they'd like to talk to me about at Sony. It was called Kazorn and the Unicorn. After about a year and a half of developing it, it became a little unclear what the studio wanted to do with the project. Sometimes that happened. And so Kazorn was sort of put aside for a while. And in the meantime, they said, look, we have another project we'd like to talk to you about. And it's called um, Smurfs. And they said, we want to do a complete reboot. And so suddenly I found myself researching. I go back to Chuck Jones, research, depth, development, really learning about the characters. And I found that the work of Peo, the original Smurfs work was so incredibly rich and fun and entertaining and appealing that I couldn't resist trying to take this on. And now, here I am developing uh, a brand new Smurfs feature. I was fortunate enough to know here at Sony, there was Noel Triojo, who was a production designer. She's from France. She grew up knowing all about the Smurfs. Patrick Mate, who I'd worked with many times at DreamWorks, uh, he was available and he knows all about the Smurfs. His ability to draw the Smurfs is almost identical to Peo. He's a wonderful character designer. I am documenting my experience and my adventure as we go and as I learn about the Smurfs on a blog called uh, smurfsproductionblog.com. I call it the blueprint. My ambition with this film is to honor the work of Peo as much as possible and to introduce a side of the Smurfs that really has never been depicted before on film in the way that we're trying to do it. What's great about working here is it's not a giant conglomerate. It's not a big giant studio with thousands of artists all doing different things. It's a, it's a smaller community, so there's a lot more interaction and a lot more time to get to know each other. I like that. I'm 
I, I want Sony Pictures Animation to be successful, but I want it to keep this sort of community feel to it because it's a very, it's a very comfortable environment.